What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. Today, we're going to be concluding our series on the progressive movement. So let's delve in. Hello, everyone. If you're here for the first time, welcome to my channel. I'm Alan. One progressive-leaning English translation of the Bible that you want to avoid is the message. As I've mentioned before, there are three types of Bible translations which are out there. There are formal equivalencies, dynamic equivalencies, and paraphrases. Formal equivalencies are more literal translations. The translators of these Bible translations attempt to provide us with as close as possible a word-for-word -word translation of the original text as they possibly can. Examples of formal equivalencies include the King James, the NASB, and the ESV. Dynamic equivalencies are more thought-for-thought -thought translations. The NIV would be an example of a dynamic equivalency. And then there are paraphrases. The passion and the message definitely fall into this final category. Paraphrases can have limited utility. A paraphrased translation of the Bible can be useful for small children and English language learners. But even in those cases, the goal should be to get off of them and onto a formal equivalency as soon as possible. And now we come to the message. The message is perhaps one of the worst, if not the worst, English Bible translation which is out there. And I use the term translation very loosely there. You can pretty much put it on the same level as the New World translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The message was constructed by former PCUSA leader, the late Eugene Peterson. For those of you unfamiliar with the PCUSA, it stands for the Presbyterian Church of the United States, and it is one of the most left-leaning progressive denominations in the English-speaking world. So what's wrong with the message? First of all, it was translated by a single individual, not a committee. This means it's filled with all of his biases on every single page. In a letter, Peterson demonstrated where his thoughts fell on the issue of man-male-woman-female unions in the church. He wrote, It is pretty clear that same gender orientation is not a sin. I think the evidence is pretty clear on that by this time. The verses that seem to discuss same gender relationships may be referring to male temple courtesans, pederasty, and the widespread promiscuity associated with pagan religion. A considerable number of biblical scholars and theologians who are evangelical and take the Bible with utmost seriousness. Now hold this position. So let's take a look at the message's rendering of one important biblical text in our contemporary era and compare it with a respectable formal equivalency. The passage we'll be looking at is Romans 1, 26 and 27. The message's translation of this text reads, Worse followed, refusing to know God. They soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women. Men didn't know how to be men. Confused, they abused and defiled one another. Women with women men with men, all lust, no love. And then they paid for it. Oh, how they paid for it. Emptied of God in love, godless, and loveless wretches. You can see here that the message seems to be communicating that a man, male, woman, female union based upon lust is what is sinful. But one based upon love is not necessarily condemned. Contrast the message's reading with the NASB. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandon the natural function of the woman and burn in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Notice that contrary to progressive views of this text, Paul uses the language of mutuality. He's not talking about it having been done to one. That word for desire there is not limited to the kind of lust context that James Brownson and Matthew Vines are talking about. The Greek term epithumia is used in the New Testament for any form of sensual intercourse expressly forbidden by God. Likewise, the language for being inflamed is also used. It's not just that they're overlusted. The argument is used as a structural argument for any desire, for any physically intimate carnal behavior that God has prohibited. I've provided links to sources below if you wanted to study the matter further. All right, that's a wrap for now. If the Lord wills, I'd like to do a couple of interim videos before we move on to Roman Catholicism and Islam. Okay, ladies and gents, if you want to share your own thoughts, be sure to do so in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, guys. If you liked that video, please give it a thumbs up. 
If you like the content here, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right. Then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. You can also follow me on Instagram. I posted a link below. Have an awesome week. And for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in the next video. God's blessings on your week.